Greetings Professor Gonzalez and fellow classmates, I'm Damien Garcia, and today I'll be taking a deeper look into The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelets by Ursula K. Le Guin. According to Biography.com, Le Guin is an award-winning novelist born in Berkeley, California. While later in life Le Guin wrote globally popular novels like Ursi and won the Living Legend Medal by the, library, by the Library of Congress, she struggled to break into the mainstream fictional world. Before she died in 2018 at 88, she had won several awards and was internationally known. Le Guin describes to the reader a utopia called Omelas. She offers almost untending in evidence that, and examples of how it is a place with only joy, no suffering, evil, or negativity. She then tells us that this place only exists if a single child is tortured and ignored, not allowed to feel any sort of joy. Most accept the terms of a place without negativity, needing the abuse of a single child, and few decide to walk away from it all. At the center of the ones who walk away from Amelas is a theme of necessary sacrifice that moves the reader, specifically those in affluent countries, to come to terms that a life is the perfect first world, where all needs can be met and there is no strife, requires the suffering of others and walking away from morally superior but ultimately idiotic. To prove how this is one of the true meanings of Le Guin's short story, I will be discussing how Amla's is a cell stand-in for the elusive and not yet created perfect first world. How Le Guin places herself as a neutral observer to better place the reader in a position to do morally reprehensible acts, and how she equates choosing to leave the perfect first world as the wrong choice. Le Guin creates an impossibly perfect create-your-own utopia through her pointedly, specifically, but also vastly known, unknown world of Amelas that entangles the reader into envisioning their own perfect first world they do anything for. Throughout the short story, Le Guin utilizes tangents and ramblings to rip the reader from fully Im imagining the world she describes so that they're yet not fully formed vision is still malleable and not able to form into the reader's idealized perfect world. The line joyous, how is one to tell about joy? How how describe the citizens of Amelas? This quote in line is the first time Le Guin rips the reader from an, a near unsending description of her idolized perfect world. It forces the reader to question if that they just read and imagined is perfect and unsureness that it is exactly what Le Guin wants the reader. As she spends the next three paragraphs, one of which consumes an entire page, hammering home the point that she that joy in the fictional world is whatever you want it to be, not what Le Guin describes it to be. By having the reader identify and create their perfect first world that they will inevitably fill with examples of the real first world that they live in. Their mind is forced to create their own view of joy and happiness through Le Guin's tangents and ramblings, which then turn into lectures and instruction. Now that Le Guin has subconsciously forced the reader to create their own perfect first world, she must make them want it so bad that they do anything to have to keep it. After Le Guin breaks off into her first tangent, later turned instructional lecture on how joy is whatever your mind makes it to be, she makes herself a neutral observer, constantly asking the reader for their feedback and creating their own imagined perfect first world, assuring they buy into the concept. What else belongs in the joyous city? By directly asking the reader this question, while she continues to offer her own description of joy, she wants them to simultaneously build their own omelas. Does she believe sorry, do you believe, do you accept the festival, the city, the joy? In this additional line, Le Guin wants the reader to almost feel like they should be audibly screaming, yes, this festival, this city I have created with you is perfect, I want it. Setting herself as, as a neutral observer with a gentle Cato prod, forcing you to imagine your own omelas, creates a level of ownership that reader can't escape when they are finally offered the final terms and conditions in order to have it, the, to the torture of the young child. After all the work settling the perfect first world, Le Guin makes the reader see that their choosing is to, their choosing to not torture the child would be foolish. Uh, foolish. 
She knows how foolish this is by contrasting descriptions of those who saw the child and felt guilt, but stayed in Amla's and those who saw the child and left. They know that if they saw if, if the wretched one were not there, sniveling in the dark, the other one, the flute player, could make no joyful music as the young writers line up in their beauty for the race in the sunlight of the first morning of summer. This is the only part of the lengthy description of the internal moral fight like Gwen describes in order to overcome the choice of torturing the child. The, that lengthy description offers the reader the space to come to terms with torturing the child. Compare that to the description of those who left, which was short to the point and really offered the reader no way to insert themselves to their mindset. The choice is clear. By going into great detail and at times over explaining about the, the battle one must do to torture the child, but not do the same for those who don't, it gives the reader an almost too easy and manipulative impulse to go in the option they know and can understand buying into torturing the child just by virtue of better marketing. Le Guin has done what very few authors could ever do, force the reader to see their own vision within the author and destroy their own moral boundaries to attain a fictionalized concept. The torture, not even the killing, of one of the child seems insignificant, almost laughable by the time you have created your own perfect first world. If you have brought into Le Guin's thought experiment as she hopes you have, would you have the necessary sacrifice to, att to attain your own idolized perfect world? Thank you so much for listening to my speech, and I hope you have a great day.